Welcome to the big interview on today's show. I'm very pleased to be joined right now by Brandon Nelson. He is Senior Portfolio Manager at the Calamos Funds. He's making his debut here on our show. He is responsible for small and mid, mid cap, small and smid cap growth strategies at Calamos. And he's an experienced money manager. And if you want to learn more, well, you're going to go find out about the Calamos Timpani Small Cap Growth Fund at calamos.com on Twitter, at Calamos. Brandon Nelson, good to chat with you here on Money Life. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, you know, when everybody's been talking the market, they've really been talking large caps. Large caps have, have dominated, and small caps throughout this entire bear market have been, well, good here, bad there. You know, people talk about the, the market, and the market has all been about large caps. And now we've seen the market get to where large caps are certainly scaring everybody. The market's potential is scaring everybody. How much is this the time for small caps to shine versus how much is this the time that small caps are going to just be riding the wave with everything else? I think it's a great time for small cap as an asset class. I can tell you sort of from a macro level, small caps look really cheap versus large caps. In fact, they're the cheapest they've been since 2003. So that's interesting in and of itself. And then from a bottom-up standpoint, the more micro level, you know, we're finding several opportunities at the stock-specific level, uh, technology, consumer discretionary, healthcare. It's probably where we're finding the most. But uh, there's a lot of tremendous investment opportunities out there uh, in the small cap world. So we're seeing uh, a lot of reasons to be taking a look at the asset class. When you talk about small caps being cheapest they have been in quite some time relative to large caps. What's the metric that you're using there to determine how one asset class is cheap versus the other one being expensive? There's some third-party research that we look at when we make that statement, and I believe they've got a variety of valuation metrics that they use. There's price-to-cash flow measures, there's price-to-earnings measures, and some other factors uh, that they consider, other metrics that they consider, and, and it's sort of a aggregate figure. And when you lump it all together, that's uh, that's sort of the output is you know, very inexpensive versus history. Okay, so so let's now extrapolate that out. When you were giving the answer, while you said that small caps were cheapest that they've been in a long time relative to large caps, you also then said, well, you know, let's break it down to the stock specific level and note that there are some very good buys. But what I'm hearing, if small caps are cheap relative to large caps, that would mean I want to make a value play on the asset class, like let's go buy small caps on an index basis because, hey, they're cheap and they should pick up. And then I want to do the stock specific stuff. Am I reading the wrong thing into that? Uh, I think you can win on a couple different levels. I think the asset class is inexpensive, as I point out. And there, and that's not always the case, but I think at this particular instant in time, you've got that as a tailwind, but you've also got uh, small cap individual situations that are also very appealing. So, you know, you want to, anytime you're making an investment in any asset class, I think you want to know, is the asset class inexpensive or expensive versus history? And then are there individual opportunities within that asset class? And my message to you is there's, I think, tailwinds uh, on a couple different levels, the asset class itself, as well as individual securities. So, um, that's why I think it's especially interesting. So as we talk right now, you know, we've got a market that has been making folks nervous. You've got all of the arguments over how much trade and tariff situations are actually impacting companies. I have heard the argument that it'll be the small cap companies that are much more impacted by trade and tariff wars than the large caps that at times makes sense. And at times it makes no sense to me, sort of depending on who's making the argument. For you, are you watching and seeing any impacts that you think are happening to small caps that aren't happening elsewhere? Or are you seeing any protections that are happening with small caps that are not happening elsewhere? So it's a mixed bag. It depends on what industry you're looking at, what sector you're looking at. I think there's uh, some sectors like industrials, small cap, industrials especially are exposed to the tariff noise, the global economic slowdown. Uh, they're more in the crosshairs of that than other sectors that are uh, maybe more domestically focused. I think small caps overall are more domestically focused, but it doesn't mean there aren't 
pockets of areas within small cap that are exposed to tariff noise and and, and uh, uh, more global sluggishness. And so if you look at our portfolio, for instance, our small cap growth portfolio, we can actually parse out the percentage of revenues coming from the United States that presumably would be less exposed to tariffs. And that is higher than the Russell 2000 growth, which is the benchmark we're measured against. So we are relatively more insulated than the benchmark itself uh, when it comes to the the tariff noise. Now let's go down. You know, you talk about we can make money in small caps on multiple levels. So moving it down from the broad level of small caps to the the industry level, what are the areas where there's some some hay to be made while the sun is shining here in terms of sectors and what have you? Uh, So from a sector standpoint, like I said before, Technology, healthcare, and consumer discretionary, that's where we're finding the most opportunities. And, and really what we're looking for are secular growth situations where companies have their own tailwinds uh, that are more at the company-specific level where they're not dependent on a robust economy or dependent on the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates, for instance. And so we're looking for fundamental momentum at uh, the stock-specific level, at the company-specific level. And we're finding that mostly in those three sectors I mentioned. Uh, And you had asked about industries. I'd say, you know, within healthcare, we've got disproportionate exposure to some servicing companies, healthcare service companies that are focused on uh, home healthcare, where patients are treated more in the home. It's the patients enjoy it more. And uh, the payers for the health care services uh, find it appealing as well because it's a lower cost setting for the payer community. That's one sort of theme you could point to within our portfolio within the health care sector. Um, education within the consumer discretionary sector has been a bit of a theme within our portfolio. You know, Online education has been a secular story for the last several years in the United States. We've got some some investments that are exposed to um, that industry and providing online degrees, providing uh, online program management, providing um, tools, online tools that students can use to uh, improve their uh, education. So those are a couple themes that come to mind. And what are you moving away from? What are you moving Mm -hmm. away from? I mean, what industries have gotten to where, you know, they just are not the opportunities and you either are cutting back or, or, you know, totally leaving them behind? Yeah, the three sectors that stand out that are seeing you know, sluggishness, fundamental sluggishness, uh, would be industrials, materials, and energy. And I think not coincidentally, those are three sectors that have more exposure to the tariff murkiness and, again, the global economic picture. And so we're, we're a bit lighter in those uh, sectors relative to the benchmark because that's where there's much less fundamental momentum. In terms of helping folks set expectations, I, I have, you can't see it, neither can my audience, but my audience has heard me discuss this before. I have on one of the walls that I'm looking at in my studio, the classic Ibbotson chart that shows stock market returns. And it's the one, mm-hmm. of course, that leads everybody to believe, oh, stocks get you 10% on average over time per annum. Well, that same chart says that small caps deliver 12%. Mm-hmm. Now, Roger Ibbotson has said that he believes that for the next 75 years, it won't be like the last 75, that the numbers will be muted. But if you had to help somebody set expectations for small caps right now, given where they've been and that they haven't necessarily during this bull market, you know, been able to keep up with large caps, let alone to make the 12% or, or make a premium, should people expect a small cap premium going forward or are things changing? And if they expect a premium, what level are we setting it at? Yeah, I don't have the crystal ball on that, uh, but I, I sure have an expectation just uh, personally that small caps will uh, outperform mid and large caps over long periods of time, even going forward. You're, you're dealing with higher risk situations in small cap relative to large cap, and usually with higher risk comes higher reward over long periods of time. And I, I believe that still holds true uh, in that asset, with that asset class relative to 
mid, large, and, and a lot of other asset classes. So I think there's still a place in most portfolios for small cap investing. Well, I don't. I certainly don't think small cap investing is going anyplace. I definitely think there is a place for it. It was more just, can you expect the outperformance, or can you do you mm-hmm. use it more as a diversifier, because it's not necessarily always going to perform in lockstep with large cap, or do you use it as a diversifier where you're saying I'm also going to get that risk premium on top? Yeah, I, again, I guess I think I I go back to. Uh, you know, I think that I think that Ibbotson chart will will hold true going forward, and and my expectation is that smalls will outperform uh, large over time. It's the last several years; it's not been the case, but uh, yeah, it's it's not going to hold true each and every year, right. each and every time period you're looking at. But my best guess is it'll still hold long term. Brandon, great stuff! Thanks so much for joining me to talk okay. about it. We look forward to the next opportunity to chat. Sounds great. Thanks. That's Brandon Nelson, everybody. He is Senior Portfolio Manager for the Calamos Funds. It's calamos.com on Twitter at Calamos if you want more information. All right, we just hit the halfway poll on today's show, but halfway means we're just getting revved up. Up next, danger, danger. David Trainer is going to be here from New Constructs, and we are heading for the danger zone. You love it. You don't want to miss it. So settle back and relax. Don't touch a mouse, a dial, or anything else. Because this is Money Life, and there's much more to go.